Hi there, I'm Dan, founder and creator of Gleanly. I want to spend a few minutes telling you about Gleanly and how it might help your organisation, as well as give you a brief demo of a real repository. Gleanly is a hub for all of your user and business research. Primarily, it's been designed with UX research and product teams in mind. However, it can be used across many teams, such as product design, marketing, sales, customer support, and business analytics to create a shared understanding of what you know, what decisions you're making, and why. Gleanly does not create any data. We don't offer analytic tools. Instead, it is a hub for what you discover from other tools and activities. We're completely agnostic on the tools that you use, so you can continue to create and analyze data by whatever means. Gleanly is built around the concept of atomic research. This simple but powerful process breaks down knowledge into four main elements. Experiments. This is what we did to discover the knowledge. It may not be as formal as an experiment. Perhaps it's data gleaned from Google Analytics or pulled from social media. But experiments are the source for your facts. Facts are what we learnt. A good fact is a quote, observation or statistic, but it's never our opinion. Insights are our opinion of why the facts the way they are. We can derive multiple insights from a single fact and we can combine lots of facts from across our repository to create an insight. Finally, recommendations are what we think we should do with this knowledge. Once again, we might have lots of ideas of what we might do about a single insight and we may bring several insights to form a single recommendation. Most recommendations are testable which then creates new experiments, and the cycle continues. This is the secret to creating a scalable knowledge repository, which both retains the what and the why certain decisions were made, and importantly, what happened after. So let's see this working in the real world. The first thing you'll notice is the navigation in Gleanly at the top here follows our atomic process. On experiments, we can see all the studies we have done. On facts, we can search all the evidence across all experiments. The Insights tab is where we can search and browse all of our insights and understand what we have learned from our research. The Recommendations tab allows us to see all of the decisions we have made or waiting to be made. I will show you all of those sections in more detail, but let's start with the experiments. At the top here, we can filter all of our experiments by type, date they were created, and custom filters. These four filters, Platform, Client, Opportunity and Team, are all custom filters that I have created for my repository. You may choose whatever makes sense to your organisation. I can also search by keyword. So these are all the experiments that I have that are titled or tagged as shipping. I'll pick this one here. And at the top, I can see all the background to this experiment. What were we trying to learn? How were we going about this? when the research was undertaken and by whom. You can have unlimited number of authors in an experiment and you can lock it so only those authors can edit or add to the experiment. However, anyone else can take the research or learnings and use them to support their own work as well. I can also link to any relevant documents, reports, prototypes or whatever you might like. These filters and tags here make the experiment easily discoverable. I can share this experiment using a link or via email. If they're already a member of my repository, I can choose their name. Or if they're not, I can enter their email address, which will create them a read-only account and send them a secure magic link. That link will bring them directly to this experiment with no need to create an account or log in. Scrolling down to the matter of the experiment, you can see I can add facts or bulk upload. I'll come back round to show you that later. I can also search the experiment by facts, insights or recommendations. Because I'm an author of this experiment, I'm viewing it fact first. This means I'm seeing how the facts are connected to the insights. I can see this fact is connected to two insights, one positively and one negatively, as in this fact is evidence to support this insight, but evidence against this one. I can also see this insight is connected to three recommendations two positively and one negatively. That's what the red dotted line indicates. So I'm viewing this from the context of a fact and what a fact is connected to. This is useful for building an experiment, but if I was a stakeholder, 
such as a product owner, manager or client, I would prefer to see the experiment from the context of the recommendations. What ideas came from this experiment? What decisions do I need to make? And what's the evidence both for and against those ideas? As a researcher browsing someone else's experiment, I may be more interested in the insights. What was learnt from the experiment? But less concerned about the what recommendations came out of it. So we're viewing this insight from the context of an experiment. But all insights and recommendations are independent items. As I mentioned earlier, we can use evidence from across the organisation to support or disprove insights and recommendations. We can now see the insight and all of the evidence from all experiments it's connected to. And we can also see all the recommendations it's connected to. Let's look at one of the recommendations. These make great assets to share with decision makers which I can do the same way we shared the experiment earlier. In fact, any asset can be easily shared, whether that is a fact, insight or recommendation. Our customers tell us that this massively reduces the amount of reporting they need to do. Stakeholders such as product owners really love this way of looking at a recommendation too. They tell us that traditional reports tend to have the evidence in one section and the recommendations in another. Whereas with Gleanly, it's all really clear how the evidence connects. It's easy to dive into that evidence to the level that they need to to confidently make that decision. They can see all the evidence for and against and from across the organisation to give them a holistic view. The evidence score allows them to move quickly when time is short or it's a quick decision to make. I'll go into that score in a bit more depth in a minute. So we've got a recommendation, we can see the evidence for it and we can decide if we're going to do this or not. What do we do next? Well, with a recommendation like this, we'd probably want to test it out in the real world and find out if it works. When we do that, we can connect up the results, see what happened. In this case, we can see we had a couple of qualitative moderated user tests that led to the recommendation. Then we did a quantitative AB test to see if it worked in the UK. And we can see that the conversion went up, but so did the cost of sales, which we were expecting. However, it made far more money in sales, so we can call that a success. The same was true when we tried it in France. But look here, when we tested in Italy, something went wrong. Conversion dropped by 12.2%. Why is this? Now, it could be that free shipping has some cultural negativity in Italy. But my first guess is something went wrong with this experiment. Perhaps there was a bug or it was mistranslated. We can potentially rescue this test and turn it into a winner. If we find out the test was broken, we can remove the experiment. They aren't facts if they're not true after all. But if we do find out there's something culturally different in Italy, I can discover what that is, connect it up, and add it to the global understanding of what free shipping means in different countries. In the future, that might change and we might start finding evidence that free shipping is no longer a negative thing. That would be connected to our research and we'll see this evidence score change. So the evidence score is a very simple thing right now. All facts are worth one, either plus one or minus one, whether they prove or disprove. In the future, we'll be able to weight these by type of evidence and age of the evidence. But for now, we find that the simple scoring is enough to allow you to get an idea of how much evidence you have without getting too caught up with making it super accurate. Let me show you an example of how this score can help you move quickly when you need to. So I'm going to the Insights tab now, and this is where researchers and product designers spend a lot of their time. Let's say someone has just come to me and said, Dan, I need a wireframe for that new feature tomorrow morning. Now I haven't got any time to read research reports and I certainly don't have any time to commission any new research. But I can come to Gleanly and search for insights from the subject I want filter as I desire, and then find out what we already know on the subject. This top one has a good evidence score relative to my little demo repository. And I can click through and get more context if I wish, or grab it with a decent level of confidence due to this evidence score. This one here looks interesting, but the score is very low. And it's all from one experiment, which might make me cautious of how relevant it is for me. So I'll probably leave it for now. Or I might say, this is really interesting, I'm going to use it, but I know that the evidence is poor, so I need to retest it when I get the chance. 
Of course, when I do so, I'll connect up my learnings to this insight and increase the global understanding of this knowledge. So the Insights tab is a good way to find out what we know across our whole repository. We often see research teams having regular meetings where they filter by insights generated this week or month and discuss them as a team. This could also be the case of recommendations. We often see product managers using this as a resource of validated ideas of what they should be working on backed up by good quality evidence. You'll notice the custom filters here are quite interesting. Now don't forget you can have whatever you like here and what makes sense for your organisation, but these are some ideas I've seen work really well in other teams. Status allows me to see what recommendations are awaiting decisions to be made. So as a product owner or manager, I might come in here and view unaction recommendations or see which have been completed and the results of that. As a researcher, I might want to see which of these need more evidence. There are a few, so I'm going to filter by priority and I can get these two booked in for my next sprint. Now, Gleaning isn't intended to be a project management tool, so usually once a recommendation is approved, it would be put into JIRA or similar to be worked on. We can link to that ticket in JIRA and JIRA can link back so those working on it can see the background and evidence behind their thinking. In fact, we greatly recommend including your development team in your repository, not just designers and managers. So we've seen all the tabs now except facts. This is the space where you can search and filter all the facts across your entire repository. This is really useful if you want to find evidence about a subject that hasn't already been connected to an insight. In the experiment, I showed you how we usually start with the facts and synthesize into insights and recommendations, but it might be that someone asks you, should we offer free shipping? That would be a recommendation with no evidence or hypothesis. Or, I believe the color green is perceived as a positive color. That would be an insight with no evidence or an assumption. I can create the insight or recommendation and connect the facts that I can find that support or disprove or I can browse for interesting facts and create an insight. Clearly works pretty much any way you want. Talking of which, I promised I'd show you how we create an experiment. There are currently three different ways to get your data into an experiment. Firstly, just creating a fact manually and entering the information. This is great for taking notes during an interview perhaps. I can then connect to insights both positively and negatively, or create a new one. Same for recommendations. This one isn't relevant to my experiment, so I'm going to hide it. The second way is to bulk upload. Output a spreadsheet from whatever tool you're using and upload it straight to Gleanly. We also have the tools to bulk tag or connect those facts to insights and those insights to recommendations. Thirdly, we're just launching a browser tool that means you can select any text from anywhere on the web and add it instantly to your experiments. Finally, we have the ability to create integrations. This is a fairly new ability for us, so we're still looking to our customers to help us decide what they want us to integrate with and how. If you join Cleanly, you'll be able to influence that discussion too. Finally, I'll show you how we manage our tags and taxonomy. Now, good quality tagging is the key to a successful repository. But unlike other products, which are basically only coding tools, Cleanly isn't so reliant on tags. This will be great news for those of you who are managing teams of non-researchers who are doing research. Of course, good tagging makes things much easier to find. But when we connect facts, insights and recommendations together, we're coding by stealth. We're creating metadata just in a very human way. Our customers who are experienced researchers tell us this helps them think deeper and broader and understand their research far better than they have ever done before. Those customers who aren't trained researchers say that this simple framework helps them create more robust research and remove personal biases. Part of that is allowing people to tag without a locked taxonomy. We found that a locked taxonomy meant that people were far less likely to tag their work. Instead, we have the concept of defined and undefined tags. When someone uses an existing tag, they will see a definition. 
These are created by those that have permission to manage the taxonomy and therefore I know they are tags that are formally part of our taxonomy. When I see one without, I know it isn't. If I need a new tag, I can use it and add it instantly. Now I can see those senior research among us cringing now, but don't worry, we thought of you too. As an admin, I can see a list of my tags, see which ones are new and decide if we're going to define them or not. I can rename them, I can merge them into an existing tag or delete entirely. And anywhere that those tags are used will now be updated. These simple but powerful tools make managing your taxonomy a breeze without putting up barriers for anyone else. I've just skimmed the surface of what is possible with Gleanly, but I hope you found it interesting and want to try it out for yourself. If you want to get started now, you can sign up for a free 30-day trial. Or if you'd find it useful to have a chat, please book in a demo on the website and I very much look forward to speaking to you in person. Gleanly, making knowledge usable.